Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. We're going to dig into Bitcoin news today. And I want to give you some ideas that will help you decide if you should buy Bitcoin now or wait. And these ideas could be crucial for you. It's, I, I believe it's crucial information to help you make a good decision. So anyway, that's my opinion. What we're going to do in this video, now we could cover a lot of different topics when it comes to, hey, is this a good time to buy Bitcoin or should I hold off on buying Bitcoin? There's a lot of different information that we could get into. This video is going to focus specifically on following the institutional money. And so we're going to look at what are institutions doing when it comes to investing in Bitcoin because we want to understand that. And, and here's kind of why I want to follow the institutional money. If you're, guy, if you're a guy or a gal like me, I, I, I only have a small amount of money that I'm putting into Bitcoin. You know, I, I, I don't even invest enough money in Bitcoin or have enough invested in Bitcoin to equal my annual salary. And, and most individual investors that I know are the same way. You know, they, they may invest 1%, 2%, 5% of their total net wealth into Bitcoin. And, and as an individual, my total net wealth in many cases isn't enough to pay my salary for, you know, my income, my, my uh, wages for an entire year. And so when it comes to institutional money, on the other hand, they're investing millions, hundreds of millions, and in some cases, billions of dollars. And so when these groups of, of, of institutions, whether it's an endowment from, fund from Harvard or Yale, or it's a family office that's investing the wealth of a particular family, or it's the um, pension fund for you know, uh, uh, the state of Texas or the state of New York or some big state uh, and they're investing their pension fund that all their employees have for retirement, regardless what kind of institution it is, they, they, they're investing millions, hundreds of millions and possibly billions of dollars. And so before they do that investment, they spend a lot of money and time on research. They go hire, hire very, very smart people and they do a lot of uh, groundwork before they make those decisions. And so instead of us doing the groundwork, we're going to look at the conclusion they came by watching the actions they take. You know, the, the, when, when an institution does something, they don't just do it willy-nilly, but they do it because it's been, it's been something that they've been talking about, something that they've uh, research that's something that they hired people that were knowledgeable about that particular topic and they did a lot of work before they invested that one million or that 10 million or that hundred million dollars into Bitcoin or into some other asset. And so what we want to do is we want to leverage the groundwork that they did by looking at the actions they took. And if we can understand what actions they're taking, then we can understand the conclusion that they came to after they did all of their research. Now, we may not have access to the information that they used to make their decision, but we can see what that information led them to conclude by their actions. So that's why we're going to look at uh, institutional money. Now, in today's video, we're going to look at Yale, Harvard, and other endowment fund investing into Bitcoin. We're going to look at New York Power Plant and how it's selling Bitcoin mining to institutions. We're going to look at a $168 billion hedge fund and its investments into Bitcoin. We're going to talk about Coinbase's institutional investing. We're going to look at Grayscale's billion dollar year of institutional investing. And we're going to talk about BACT, how it's launching its institutional custody service and BACT in particular services institutions. I'm going to give you a little bit of history about BACT. And then after all of that, we'll conclude the video. But I will give you some tips if you decide that you want to buy Bitcoin on where you can go to purchase it. Um, they're actually pretty simple tips, so it, it'll take us 
a few seconds to cover that part. But before we get into it all, whoops, actually I want to go one other couple of slides here. So we're going to talk about should I buy Bitcoin now or wait? This is ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Can we get this video to 99 likes? Please help us out. It really does make a difference in the Google algorithms as to how they will rank this video. If you like the video and if you comment on it, if you engage with the video as well as watch it all the way to the end. You know, one of the reasons why I tell you what we're going to cover, I want to give you a reason to watch the video all the way to the end. And all of those things, Google and YouTube take that into account in terms of how they rank videos. And so it really does make a big difference. Now, this is my disclaimer. I'm not a financial advisor, and what we're going to talk about is not financial advice. This is my opinion. This is the information that I share with my mom when I want to tell her and encourage her to invest in Bitcoin because I want her to make good decisions about it. All right, so let's take a fast look at the cryptocurrency market. Right now, at this moment, Bitcoin is trading at $7,132. It's up 2.5% since yesterday. Right now, today is 6.55 a.m. Central Standard Time on April 23rd, 2020. And as you can see, for the most part, the entire cryptocurrency market is in the green, uh, with a lot of them up 4% in 24 hours, uh, 2% in 24 hours... 2%, 4% looks like, kind of, here's 6% for Tezos. Um, so it looks like for the most part, 6% is on the high side uh, for the larger cryptocurrencies. Now, as you can see, here's a whole ton of small ones because there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies out there. Now, the vast majority of endowment funds are testing crypto investments. When we're talking about endowment funds, these are the this is Yale has a thirty billion dollar endowment fund that they invest in different things, and they've been investing in cryptocurrency since two thousand eighteen, and so Yale, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, all of these different big colleges have very very large endowment funds. And they invest that endowment money into all kinds of different things. Yale and Harvard in particular have a history of being on the cutting edge of investments and also for growing their investments dramatically. Um, because it was in the mid-90s, I don't remember the exact date, that the Yale Endowment Fund was somewhere around uh, 800 million. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers. I'd have to go look them up. I'm trying to go off of memory. But anyway, they've grown it to somewhere around $35 billion. And so they've had a very dramatic, much bigger than this S&P 500 growth um, by investing in some cases in risky uh, assets like cryptocurrency. Um, but in this particular study, endowment funds have been allocating crypto related investments throughout 2018 and plan to continue their activity the next year despite lingering concerns over regulation volatility and liquidity now as you can tell we're looking at an older article this came out april 2019 it's kind of funny thinking one year ago is an older article but you know when it comes to cryptocurrency and the vast wealth of news that kind of is i tried to see if i could find an update to this information and I haven't been able to, but I thought it was valuable enough, I still wanna share it with you. So according to a survey of 150 endowment funds conducted Q4 2018 by Global Custodian, uh, et cetera, 94% said that they had already invested in crypto related initiatives in the past 12 months. Over 54% said through direct investment in individual crypto assets, while 46% gained their exposure through funds of one kind or another. And so uh, here is the actual study. Let me jump up here. The institutional crypto backers, how endowments are all allocating to cryptocurrency investments. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I am going to leave a link to this article and all of the articles I cover today in the description on the YouTube channel. So if you see anything that you wanna read the entire article, 
um, you'll be able to just go to the YouTube description, click that link, and read the article in its entirety. Um, some key findings was 94% of endowments have taken part in crypto-related investment initiatives in the past 12 months. 94 believe the endowment sector's allocation to crypto-related investments will increase or stay the same in 2019. 54% of these investments were direct, while 40%, 46% were through a fund. Now, I think this is really interesting that 54%, and, and, and keep in mind, we're talking about endowment funds that are through colleges and endowment funds through other organizations. Um, and these are, these are not just your run-of-the-mill college. This is your Yale, your Harvard, your Stanford, your MIT, etc. Um, and that 54% of them are, are, I don't know if they're self-custodying, but they have directly bought Bitcoin. They have directly bought other assets, um, similar uh, other cryptocurrency assets, but they bought the actual cryptocurrency themselves, which I think is quite interesting. So this quote here, we are in the beginning stages of looking at this as a new asset class for endowment funds. And that statement is quite significant. You can also see here that 89% uh, were in the United States. That's 89% of the 154 endowment funds that they surveyed were US-based endowment funds. Looks like a number of them were in the United Kingdom and then elsewhere around the world. So has your endowment taken any crypto-related investments initiatives in the past 20, 12 months? And 94% of them said yes. So anyway, that's enough out of that article. If you want, again, I, like I mentioned, you can uh, go to the, this article itself, the actual full thing, and read it um, by using the links in the description in the YouTube channel. So I also mentioned that we're going to talk about a New York power plant. Now this power plant, as you can see, has built a significant Bitcoin mining farm. And they're using excess power, power that's not been bought by the state of New York or any other of the principalities. It's just excess power. And they're able to turn that excess power into Bitcoin. And then they're selling that mining hash rate to institutional buyers. And so that's significant, A, that, that they're using excess electricity to mine Bitcoin, and then B, they're either selling that hash rate or they're selling that actual cryptocurrency uh, off to institutions. So it's interesting that they've been able to find institutions that are willing to buy that from them. So it just, it just goes to all the different ways... See, institutions are going to get invested in cryptocurrency in some very, very creative ways. I never would have thought of that. If you had said, hey, do you think institutions are going to buy from power plants uh, Bitcoin? I would have said, huh? <laughs> so, but it's a real deal. Now, a couple of days ago, I talked about the Renaissance uh, uh, hedge fund. And Renaissance hedge fund is getting involved in Bitcoin and Bitcoin futures what I didn't know when I read that article and, and it became part of one of my videos is that Renaissance is a $166 billion asset manager. So I had no clue how big Renaissance actually is. $166 billion. So let's kind of get into this for a second. The quantitative analysis heavy firm has permitted the Medallion Fund to enter the Chicago Mercantile Exchange CME's cash-settled Bitcoin futures market, according to March 30th Form ADV Investor Brochure. Renaissance, which had nearly $166 billion in regulatory assets under management at the end of 2019, according to that filing, has effectively signaled Bitcoin could be or already is a factor in its flagship medallion fund whose 66% average pre-annual return since 19, 1988 is unmatched on Wall Street. Now let that sink in for a second. This is a company that invests in other assets historically like stocks and bonds and mutual funds and who knows. I, I'm not familiar 
Uh, I heard of Renaissance for the first time this week, a couple of days ago, and that's why when I originally did that video, I had no clue how big this firm really was, other than what was mentioned in the article that I was using for the video. So this article is giving me more details about it and helping me appreciate who this business is. And part of who this business is, is they they have been able to make a 66% annual return on the way that they're investing in things. And the majority of their investments, based on what I know at the moment, has been through uh, mind-bending math in stocks. All right? So, so they've, they've been able... I mean, the standards and pours, the S&P 500 never hit 66% in a single year. But these guys are making 66% in a single year, and that's before they take their fee and then turn profits over to their customers. Because their customers don't get the 66%, they take a hefty fee and then give the balance back to the customer. And so I thought that was quite interesting. That is a huge profit from investing in stocks. And they're doing it through um, quantitative analysis. In other words, they wrote a computer program that analyzes the data, makes decisions about what stocks to buy and sell, and then it automatically will buy and sell those stocks. So whether Medallion is participating in that market is unknown. The disclosure did not state if Medallion had begun buying Bitcoin future contracts or plan to do it in the future, and Renaissance notoriously tight-lipped about its best-performing fund did not respond to requests for comment. And so, uh, a little, a, a a little bit more research into Renaissance, I think, would be good. I'd I'd love to find out more about them, and so I may have more information about Renaissance in a later video. If I find anything that I think, hey, this would be great to put into one of my videos. Next up, Coinbase institutional folks buying 200 to $400 million worth of crypto every week. And so whether institutions were going to adopt crypto or not was an open question about 12 months ago. And that would have been around uh, 2018. August of 2018, people were uncertain if institutions were going to touch Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. But uh, Brian Armstrong said, I think it's safe to say now we know the answer. We are seeing 200 to $400 million a week in new crypto deposits come in from institutional customers. Now, that was Brian Armstrong, who is uh, the owner of Coinbase, one of the larger exchanges. And Coinbase has gone on to say, I think it was, It'll be in something else, so I'll, I'll, I'll save that thunder for the next stop. But anyway, Brian Armstrong, owner of Coinbase, they're getting a lot of institutional money. Here's another article about Coinbase. The next phase of our institutional strategy, and this article is, is recent. It came out a few days ago on April 20th. So over the past 12 months, Coinbase has been laser focused on building out the types of features and services that our institutional customers need. Interesting. Since the launch of our institutional suite in May 2018, the maturation of the crypto as an asset class has progressed at a rapid pace. Today, Coinbase plays a lead role in a thriving ecosystem of institutional crypto offerings. Now, Brett uh, and Brett, forgive me for, I'm, I don't think I'm going to pronounce your name right. I'm going to try my best. Uh, to Paul. Brett to Paul is a executive with Coinbase and he came from, it said it here in the article. Anyway, he came from the banking industry uh, from both UK and Asia. Uh, let me actually make sure I'm quoting this correctly. In his new role at Coinbase, Brett and his team in New York, San Francisco, the UK and Asia. Okay, so that's just where his team is located will be focused on the continued institutionalization of crypto. All right, so this is the stuff that I wanted to share with you. Our exchange, Coinbase Pro, has rolled out margin trading to institutional investors 
in 45 states across the U.S., along with a portfolio of features that allows traders to segregate trading strategies and operate multiple managed client accounts and a powerful yet intuitive mobile trading platform for iOS and Android devices. Our institutional-grade custodian, Coinbase Custody, recently topped more than $8 billion in crypto assets stored. So I want you to think about that for a second. A year ago, they were talking about receiving two to four hundred million dollars a week in institutional investing. And that institutional investing on a weekly basis of two to four hundred million has grown to a sizable balance of eight billion dollars in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, and in other cryptocurrencies. Eight billion dollars is under Coinbase's custody. And so uh, $8 billion in crypto assets stored and it's only crypto custodian to attain both a SOC 1 and SOC 2 compliance reports. This builds on a strong year of Coinbase custody where in other firsts we brought unique crypto native features like Tezos staking and compound governance to our clients around the world. So some of my audience is not going to be very familiar with Tezos staking, but Tezos is a specific cryptocurrency coin. And when you stake it, basically you're locking your cryptocurrency up in a smart contract, but then you get interest on a daily or monthly basis, daily, weekly, or monthly, depending on how that staking is actually set up. And different st- different coins have different staking uh, 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 agreements and even when you look at Tezos, let's talk about Tezos for an example. I didn't want to navigate to that. I'm going to try and go back to where we were. Oh, did you open up a new? Yeah, you opened a new window. So um, Tezos may have one set, like like we're going to pay you once a month and you have to have it locked up for six weeks and da, da, da. They may have their own list of criteria for you to be able to stake the Tezo cryptocurrency, but when you do it on Coinbase, Coinbase can add or alter that particular list. Coinbase may decide it's okay if you take it out early, or they may decide, no, we need you to lock it up for a longer period of time. And so they'll, if you're going to do staking and you're going to do it on an exchange such as Coinbase or one of the others, you want to find out the details of how that staking works, how much money you're going to make, Um, And what are the restrictions? Like how long do you have to keep it in there? Is there specific time periods, et cetera, et cetera? Because all of those details will change even if you've looked, even if you're familiar with how it works with Tezos, if you're doing it on an exchange or through another entity, they may have their own set of requirements that they've uh, uh, set up that would be different than the actual requirements if you did Tezos yourself directly. And so all of that is stuff that you'll want to take a look at. But uh, when you're staking a cryptocurrency, that can be very profitable. It's it's a great way, instead of uh, putting your money in a bank account, this is an alternative way to put money into some sort of savings and still get uh, interest on a, a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, just depends on what staking you're actually getting involved with. So just wanted to open your eyes up to that, but it's interesting to me that institutions are thinking of staking because instead of institutions putting their money in a savings account at Bank of America or some other banking institution, uh, many institutions are taking advantage of what Coinbase is making available to them through Tezos staking and compound governance and other other similar vehicles where through cryptocurrency you can make a interest rate a compounding interest um, by by locking up that cryptocurrency through the coinbase platform so coinbase went on to say that institutional investors now make up to 60 percent of all coinbase trading now coinbase does billions of dollars a year in trading Uh, uh, different cryptocurrency products, different cryptocurrencies. I've gone on, in fact, the very, very first Bitcoin I ever bought, I went to Coinbase. I created a Coinbase account on the Coinbase exchange and I bought Bitcoin 
uh, through Coinbase. That was the very time, first time I got any, any actual exposure to any cryptocurrency was through Coinbase. And it's interesting to me that 60% of all of their transactions are, are institutions. So Brian Armstrong, Coinbase's co-founder and CEO, has revealed the majority of traders on Coinbase Pro are now institutional investors. Speaking to Fred Wilson, co-founder of Union Square Ventures and investor in Coinbase, Armstrong said 90% of the money in the world is tied up in institutions. It's not just retail. So we started talking to these potential customers. So that's a big deal. 90% of the money in the world is tied up in institutions. And so if you want to know when cryptocurrency is going to go mainstream, follow the institutional money. Now, more institutions are investing in cryptocurrency. Um, Grayscale raises $500 million in Q1 of 2020. And so we're going to cover this super briefly. Cryptocurrency management firm Grayscale Investments has published a groundbreaking financial report for 2020 quarter one, a feat that saw a majority of the firm's revenue come from institutional investors. According to an official announcement made by the investment fund firm today, Grayscale Investments products raised more than $503.7 million in the first quarter of 2020, and an, an achievement that saw the firm smash its previous all-time high of $254 million. So two things that's important about this is to notice, A, the previous all-time high was the last, was the third quarter of 2019. So it wasn't that long ago that they hit the previous all-time high. The second thing to take note of is the previous all-time high was 254 million and they doubled that all-time high to 503 million. So this shows you that the amount of institutional money that is getting involved in cryptocurrency is actually on the on a dramatic increase. When they can double the amount of institutional money from a pre from two quarters ago and those both were both of those quarters were their all-time highs for Grayscale. That is big news. Now, you may remember on a previous video, I talked about how Grayscale currently owns 1.2% of all Bitcoin in the world. But at this rate, Grayscale, at, at this kind of growth, Grayscale could end up being one of the largest uh, holders of Bitcoin um, in the entire world. I mean, now that they already own 1.2% of all Bitcoin that's in existence, they're definitely one of the big dogs, but they could end up being the biggest dog. Hard to say, time will tell. Now we're going to talk about BACT. I don't know if you're familiar with BACT, so I'm going to give you a slight history lesson about who they are before I really get into this. But BACT is a joint venture between the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange. And that name of that company is called the Intercontinental Exchange. They own the New York Stock Exchange and they own exchanges all over the world. They own 12 different uh, exchanges similar to the New York Stock Exchange. When you're looking, when you hear on the radio that they say that the price of oil is you know, $50 a barrel or it's $20 a barrel or whatever the current price of oil is. In most cases, that information comes from one of the intercontinental exchanges, one of the exchanges that they own. So they're a $9 billion a year corporation and they teamed up with Starbucks and Microsoft in order to build a cryptocurrency exchange. And so they spent four years and almost $500 million in order to build the backed company, which has a custody service and cryptocurrency exchanges. So the custody service is specifically built for institutions. So if you're, a, you're a Yale, for example, and you've decided out of your 35 billion, you're going to take uh, whatever, several hundred million dollars and you want to put it into cryptocurrency, um, you might choose the backed custody service because you need to make sure that, that that money can't, that cryptocurrency cannot be stolen. 
And so most institutions, most family offices, most pension funds are required to put to have that asset under a third party's custody so that it's less likely that an internal employee could actually steal that asset. Um, and BACT is one of the custodies, just like Coinbase, BACT is another company that, that institutions will go to and pay to have them custody their Bitcoin for them. A um, couple of things for institutional clients, it's often inconvenient to buy Bitcoin and store it themselves. Instead, they favor a third-party service provider. BACT now wants to be that provider by launching its institutional custody service. Following approval by the New York DFS, the company can offer Bitcoin custody to all institutions. Some companies are already signing up for the new service. The list includes Pantera Capital, Galaxy Digital, Tagami, and a lot of others. Onboarding additional companies will be an ongoing process. The secure, the securely, to securely store the assets, BACT will use a biometrically controlled bank-grade vaults and enterprise-grade hardware security modules. There are also primary and secondary facilities distributed around the world. Transactions will need to be signaled by multiple entities across different ge geographical locations. And so they really have gone to the nth degree in order to make sure that they can protect these large, large amounts of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in their vaults and under their custody service. Another thing that I wanted to share with you about the BACT in particular is BACT is on the verge of launching their own application and the BACT app will be a phone app and it does a lot more than just cryptocurrency. You can manage all of your digital assets in one place. With the BACT app, you get the full picture, aggregate your digital assets, which is, includes loyalty and reward points, in-game assets, cryptocurrency, and cash, and watch your portfolio value climb. So they can convert reward mo rewards, miles, and points instantly into cash. Turning digital assets to cash has never been easier. Get instant liquidity from your points, your airline miles, and even gaming assets. So if you're a gamer and you have gaming assets, some of those assets can be uh, put out onto your uh, the backed application when it's available, and then you would be able to buy a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks or wherever. You'll be able to buy and sell crypto easily and securely without trading fees on this app, and you can pay your friends or at the store. And so like I mentioned, BACT is a joint venture between three companies, the company that owns the uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange, Starbucks, and Microsoft. Now Microsoft has a host of other companies that they are hosting their online stores. And so between the online stores under Microsoft, the physical stores that are at Starbucks, and the intercontinental exchanges software and technology development that they've used for building the New York Stock Exchange and making it digital, along with a whole host of other exchanges around the world and getting them to be digital also. That's kind of what uh, the, the specialty of the Intercontinental Exchange has been. They buy up these exchanges and they've been instrumental in making them digital and online. And so the end result is this will be quite the interesting app. Um, there was some screenshots of the app. Let's click on the learn more about rewards and see. Ah, here we go. Okay, so you can see kind of a screenshot of what it'll look like on your phone. You can see in here that they're talking about coffee company rewards, airline miles, fuel points, beauty rewards, and more. And it talks about how much money you had under the rewards, how much money you have under in-game uh, in game points, how much cash you had, how much crypto you had, and then the total value of your portfolio. And so this is also related to institutions because BACT is primarily or was originally built for institutions 
but this is their uh, retail side uh, that they're coming out and helping cryptocurrency gain mass adoption through this retail app that will be available in the very near future. And so I'm gonna put this link out there in case you wanna learn more about the backed app. In the meantime, I promised you, how do you buy Bitcoin? My recommendation is go to Google and Google out different exchanges. Coinbase is the largest exchange in the United States. Coinbase is based out of San Francisco. And so it's a US-based company. Gemini is another US-based US company. It was founded by the, um, uh, I, the twins. All of a sudden, I, I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the twins, but they were involved with Facebook at one time. They won a large settlement from Facebook, and they used that money to start the Gemini cryptocurrency exchange. And so uh, they have done very, very well. And it's one of the big exchanges that's also a U.S.-based company. Now, Binance um, is, was originally a China-based company, and then they've moved their home offices a number of times. And uh, I don't know where. They kind of say that they're a virtual company, and so it's not clear where their current office is. I've traded uh, cryptocurrency in all three of these exchanges. I, I stopped trading on the Binax exchange when they decided that their main exchange could no longer service U.S. customers. Um, but if you're not in the U.S., the Binance's main exchange is something that's still available for people outside of the United States. And so if you're not able to access Coinbase or Gemini, Binance's main exchange may be an option to you. Also, Binance has created a U.S.-based exchange, and that might be an option to you. I would recommend checking out at least these three and maybe a few others. There's lots of, lots of other exchanges. Um, and, and all you do when you go to Coinbase to set up an account, you're basically, it's like setting up an online banking account. If you were to set up a bank account um, online, you would take a photo of your driver's license and a few other things in order to set up the account. And setting up a Coinbase account is a similar exercise but it allows you to transfer money either from a, uh, a credit card or directly out of your bank account, whether it's a savings or checking account, you get to decide. And then you can transfer money directly out of that account into Coinbase and buy Bitcoin directly or buy other cryptocurrencies. Um, and with all three of these, you could leave that cryptocurrency on the exchange. I always recommend that you use a hardware wallet. But hey, if you've only got a few dollars invested on the exchange, it may not be worth making a $50 purchase to get a hardware wallet in order to custody your cryptocurrency. So that'll be up to your decision. You'll need to decide, hey, do I have enough cryptocurrency? I want to protect it with a hardware wallet or... No, my account's so small, that's not worth buy, spending $50 to buy a hardware wallet. I'll just leave it on the exchange. And so uh, just one of those decisions that you need to make. But it's really easy to do it. Do me a favor. And, and you know when you go to Facebook or Twitter or many of these other different online social media platforms, you're going to see a bazillion ads of somebody saying, oh, I've made... Two Bitcoins, I started out with only $100 and now I have two Bitcoins because Mr. So-and-so helped me do it. And if you, if you give your money or if you give your crypto to Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so or whoever it is, they're going to help you make a whole bunch of, of money. Don't do those things. Those are scams. Go with somebody that's legitimate, that's regulated by governments that you can trust. Um, rather than trying to go with some of these, there's, there's just so many scams out there. Uh, don't trust them. Go with one of the big exchanges, or if you find an exchange you feel comfortable with, you can go with them as well. So, and, and again, this is not financial advice. This is my opinion. Um, I hate it when I hear people who said, oh yeah, I gave so much money to Mr. So-and-so who promised that they could take my $100 and turn it into three Bitcoins or three Ethereum, or three whatever crypto, and uh, now I've lost my money because they've just disappeared into the wind. So I, I, this is just a definitely the more safe way to go. 
How can I be of service to you? Do you have any questions, thoughts, comments? Do you disagree with anything that I said? I would love to hear your polite disagreements because you know things I don't know. I know things you don't know. And when we share what we know, we're going to grow smarter together. I want to grow smarter together with you. Please leave your comments below because I would love to hear from you. In the meantime, like, subscribe, and hodl. And I hope that you have a fantastic day.